Hi, everyone. We're going to start. Um, sorry, we're a bit late. I'm Lee Markopoulos. I'm the chair of CCA's graduate program in curatorial practice, and I'm one of the organizers of this series, which is called Sound and Vision, um, which is seeking to explore uh, interesting developments in contemporary sound production and music production. Um, and it's being sponsored by the graduate department here at CCA, the graduate department, uh, plural. So tonight's talk was conceived of as an exchange between Marina Rosenfeld, who's a composer, musician, and visual artist, and Christoph Cox, about whom I'll say more in a moment. But unfortunately, Marina uh, has at the very last moment had to cancel her participation due to unexpected circumstances. So we're truly sorry not to have the opportunity to hear from her, but we're also very delighted to have Christoph here tonight, and we're very appreciative that he's agreed to perform solo. So um, what follows tonight is an experimental lecture entitled Matter, parentheses, in several phases. Um, and it, broadly speaking, looks at art and materialism. And Christoph will say more about what that means when he's up. Um, before that, let me tell you a bit about Christoph. Uh, he's a professor of philosophy at Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts. His studies and doctorate have traced paths through modern culture, media, and the history of consciousness. And he teaches and writes predominantly on 19th and 20th century European philosophy and cultural theory. I first encountered Christoph as a curator when an exhibition he organized traveled to New Langton Arts, which was, for those of you who don't know, an art space here in San Francisco. It's now defunct. Um, and this exhibition showed at New Langton in 2008, and it was entitled Every Sound You Can Imagine. It was an incredible exhibition that presented experimental music scores, sampling a wide array of notational strategies and exploring the cross-fertilization between musicians and visual artists, uh, revealing as it did so the vital connections between experimental sound art and cutting-edge visual art. Christoph has curated other shows at The Kitchen in New York, for example, and he's also an established writer who has written about music and art since the mid-90s, as well as, of course, philosophy and his broader um, expertise, areas of expertise. Uh, in addition to contributing catalog essays for exhibitions at the Whitney, the Museum of Modern Art, Mass Mocha, and Berlin's Akademie der Künste, he is the author of a book, Nietzsche, Naturalism, and Interpretation, and he also finds time to function as co-editor of Audio Culture, Readings in Modern Music, as well as editor-at-large for Cabinet Magazine. And amazingly, also to write regularly for Art Forum and The Wire, as well as publish in numerous um, peer-reviewed publications, such as the Journals of the History of Philosophy. He's currently at work on two books, a monograph on sound art, experimental music and metaphysics, and an edited volume on aesthetics and the new realist and materialist philosophies. I admire Christoph's bravery in embracing the experimental and courting the unpredictable, and I'm delighted that he's here tonight to take us along with him on one of his journeys. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Christoph Cox. Thanks very much, Lee. Um, we academics don't often uh, it's not often said about us that we're about to perform. <laughs> Usually we just <laughs> blather on. Um, uh, let me just say a, a few things. Um, I'm going to talk for about um, 45 minutes or so, um, but I wanted to give a brief introduction to what I'm going to do. Uh, I think it'll be somewhat helpful. Um, the, the, the talk or the, uh, the piece I want to um, present tonight comes out of two of my interests, two of my two things that have interested me in particularly in the past couple of years. One of them is an interest in the origins of, of sound installation in the late 1960s um, in relationship to other important art movements of the time, particularly conceptual art. Um, and you'll, 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 you'll see that there. I'm also interested in the recent resurgence of realist and materialist philosophies, again, about which you'll hear more, and, and particularly their interest, uh, the, the relationship between realism and materialism and aesthetics. Um, briefly, the, to give a, uh, the, the broadest possible scope for, for what I'm gonna do, um, what Lucy Lepard famously described as the dematerialization of the art object at the end of the 1960s, I think opened up two different paths for artistic practice. On the one hand, art could turn away from the object and move toward the concept, toward language. On the other hand, art could explore 
a conception of matter and materiality, matter conceived broadly beyond objects as a kind of profusion of energetic fluxes. And I read sound art very much as having to do with this latter, this, this latter aspect. Um, and I think there are other, other things that, that will connect with that as well. For example, structural film, materialist structural film, I think is very much along this, this kind of materialist aesthetics path, which was one of those two paths opened up by that dematerialization of the art object. The, the theoretical, all the theoretical programs, the dominant theoretical programs um, of the 60s and 70s, I'm thinking of post-structuralism, deconstruction, psychoanalysis, very strongly favored the former approach, the, the conceptualist approach, um, which, uh, and, and I think this approach in general, this theoretical approach, tended to look with great suspicion on any conception of a, of a sort of non-discursive reality. Um, and it tended to treat those statements or artistic projects that tr dealt with a non-discursive reality as kind of naive or retrograde. Um, the, 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 this general materialist approach, I think, then was sidelined by, by critics and art historians and left without a kind of robust theoretical uh, approach or, or, or program. But I think the revival of realism and materialism in, um, in philosophy over the past couple decades, about which I can say more later, uh, has been concomitant with a resurgence of interest in sound art and sound installation over around the same time. And I don't think the, this is I don't think this is coincidental. I think I think these things are related. Um, so just quickly, what I'm what I'll present now is um, is is a is a piece. That or a, or, a, or a talk or a lecture um, that all of the material from which is borrowed from other sources, none of the words or or or, or images, of course, or sounds are my own. They're all they're all sourced from other material, and I um, I, I can say a little bit why later on why I was interested in doing it in this way. Um, but so that that's the case, um, and and I'm happy to. So I'll just I'll present this, and then we can we can talk afterwards. I'm really happy to talk afterwards. Uh, about some of the philosophical interests that, that animate the project and about the artworks and, and a whole host of things that come up, so, okay. During the 1960s, the anti-intellectual, emotional, intuitive processes of art making characteristic of the last two decades have begun give, to give way to an ultra-conceptual art that emphasizes the thinking process almost exclusively. As more and more work is designed in the studio but executed elsewhere by professional craftsmen, as the object becomes merely the end product, a number of artists are losing interest in the physical evolution of the work of art. The studio is again becoming a study such a trend appears to be provoking a profound dematerialization of art, especially of art as object, and if it continues to prevail, it may result in the objects becoming wholly obsolete. The visual arts at the moment seem to hover at a crossroad that may well turn out to be two roads to one place, though they appear to have come from two sources, art as idea and art as action. In the first case, matter is denied as sensation has been converted into concept. In the second case, matter has been transformed into energy and time motion. If the completely conceptual work of art, in which the object is simply an epilogue to the fully evolved concept, seems to exclude the objet d'art, so does the primitivizing strain of sensuous identification and envelopment in a work so expanded that it's inseparable from its non-art surroundings.
When a thing is seen through the consciousness of temporality, it's changed into something that's nothing. Separate things, forms, objects, shapes, etc., with beginnings and endings, are mere convenient fictions. There is only an uncertain, disintegrating order that transcends the limits of rational separations. The fictions er erected in the eroding time stream are apt to be swamped at any moment. The brain itself resembles an eroded rock from which ideas and ideals leak. Drill a hole about a mile into the earth and drop a microphone to within a few feet of the bottom. Mount the amplifier and speaker in a very large empty room and adjust the volume to make audible any sounds that may come from the cavity. The thin rocky crust on which we live and which we call our land and home is perhaps the Earth's least important component. The crust is indeed a mere hardening within the greater system of underground lava flows, um, which organizing themselves into large conveyor belts are the main factor in the genesis of the most salient and apparently durable structures of the crusty surface. Either directly via volcanic activity or indirectly by forcing continental plates to collide, thereby creating the great folded mountain ranges, it is the self-organized activity of lava flows that is at the origin of many geological forms. The rocks and mountains that define the most durable traits of our reality merely represent a local slowing down of this flowing reality. It is almost as if every part of the mineral world could be defined simply by specifying its chemical composition and its speed of flow, very slow for rocks, faster for lava. Similarly, our individual bodies and minds are mere coagulations or decelerations in the flows of biomass, genes, memes, and norms. Here too we might be defined both by the materials we are temporarily binding or chaining to our organic bodies and cultural minds, and by the timescale of the binding operation. Over the millennia, it is the flow of biomass through food webs as well as the flow of genes through generations that matters, not the bodies and species that emerge from these flows. Our languages may also be seen over time as a momentary slowings down or thickenings in a flow of norms that gives rise to a multitude of different structures. And a similar point applies to our institutions, which may also be considered transitory hardenings in the flows of money, routines, and prestige, and if they have acquired a permanent building to house them in the mineral flows from which the construction materials derive. In a very real sense, reality is a single matter energy undergoing phase transitions of various kinds. Rocks and winds, germs and words are all different manifestations of this dynamic material reality, or in other words, are all different ways in which this single matter energy expresses itself. Thus, what follows will not be a chronicle of man and his historical achievements, but a philosophical meditation on the history of matter energy in its different forms and the multiple coexistences and interactions of these forms.
I am speaking of the flux, the laminar flow that is sown here and there with turbulence in which perhaps the things of nature are born. I speak in several voices of the sheet of white water flowing along and of the white noise escaping from it that I can hear. I speak of the multiple fluctuations in the flux. I am speaking only of pure process now. It has long been known that once a certain, rate of, a certain flow rate of flux has been reached, turbulence may occur in a fluid. Michel Serre has recently recalled that the early atomists were so concerned about turbulent flow that it seems legitimate to consider turbulence as a basic source of inspiration of Lucretian physics. Sometimes, wrote Lucretius, at uncertain times and places, the eternal universal fall of atoms is disturbed by a very slight deviation, the clinamen. The resulting vortex gives rise to the world, to all natural things. The clinamen, this spontaneous, unpredictable deviation, has often been criticized as one of the main weaknesses of Lucretian physics, as being something introduced ad hoc. In fact, the contrary is true. The clinamen attempts to explain events such as laminar flow ceasing to be stable and spontaneously turning into turbulent flow. Today, hydrodynamic experts test the stability of fluid flow by introducing a perturbation that expresses the effect of molecular disorder added to the average flow. We are not so far from the clinamen of Lucretius. For a long time, turbulence was identified with disorder or noise. Today, we know that this is not the case. Indeed, while turbulent motion appears as irregular or chaotic on the, mac on the macroscopic scale, it is on the contrary highly organized on the microscopic scale. The multiple space and time scales involved in turbulence correspond to the coherent behavior of millions and millions of molecules. Viewed in this way, the transition from laminar flow to turbulence is a process of self-organization.
Our globe is surrounded by a transparent elastic fluid, which we call air, in whose absence no process of nature flourishes, without which animal as well as vegetable life would be totally extinguished, the universal vehicle of all life-giving forces, an inexhaustible resource from which both animate and inanimate nature draw everything necessary to their welfare. The atmospheric air changes daily in innumerable ways, and only the persistency of these alterations gives it a certain universal character which can pertain to it only as such and taken as a whole. Our air is the result of thousands of developments that occur on and in the earth. While the vegetable kingdom exhales the purest air, the animal kingdom breathes out a kind of air that is unsuitable for the support of life and proportionately lessens the purity of the air. The collectively uniform distribution of substances which dispense ever new materials in nicely calculated proportions into the atmospheric cycle never lets it reach the point where a perfectly pure air would exhaust our vital forces, or a mephitic gas would stifle all the needs of life. Materials that nature could not entrust to every region of the earth, and that are necessary to the constant renewal of the air, she conveys nonetheless to the atmospheric cycle of distant regions by winds and storms. In issue five of Music's magazines, published in 1976, Max Eastley wrote a short history of Aeolian harps, including the story of St. Dunstan, who narrowly avoided incineration at the stake in the Middle Ages for the suspiciously demonic crime of making a harp that played by itself. Eastley also related the interesting case of Ichabod Angus Mackenzie, a sculptor and musician who produced 53 wind sound sculptures in 1934. During an interview, he was asked if it disturbed him to leave his instruments performing alone without a human audience, Eastley wrote. He replied, that's up to humans. They are never without an audience. I made hundreds of small paper air veins, light, very simple and fragile. These paper veins seem to turn without any friction. They sense the softest of flows and give way to the air with no will of their own. They purely follow the airflow. When they are set up on the floor, forming a field of white moving paper, we see how the air flows in curves along the floor at our feet, how small whirlwinds are formed when we walk. In a room warmed by the light of the sun, the veins may point east in the morning and west in the late afternoon. You may find them pointing toward you as the air is moved by even the warmth of just one human body. Patterns are continually changing. The veins are never at rest. In response to Joe Good's window paintings of the mid-60s and wondering why he would not have just uh, used the actual windows as he claimed to be interested in the window phenomenon, I decided to open my own window and sit beside it and feel the air as it passed through. This was the first step that eventually led to the airworks. Next, I opened various windows in the apartment in east-west directions and observed the air as it condensed and accelerated in corridor-like zones of the apartment, the Venturi effect. Finally, I bought a standard fan from Sears and placed it on the floor. In the airworks, I attempted to avoid specific formally ordered art object materiality. I decided that I wanted the air generating units concealed, so I purchased some two by fours to frame in the ceiling and enough drywall to finish the garage walls and construct four by four movable panels to be placed above the ceiling frame. 
the air blower was installed above the ceiling to generate a vertical column of accelerated air from ceiling to floor. The air units were moved around to different ceiling outlets to produce linear, ambient, and planar bodies of air for a more efficient and versatile air delivery system. In this work, I was dealing with air as an elementary material of unlimited presence and availability as opposed to visually determined elements. I intervened, therefore, to structure this material given in the exhibition container itself and to reintegrate it into the exhibition area. It was necessary to enclose the generating device and integrate the enclosure with its architectural context in order to focus the viewer's attention on an ordered body of air juxtaposed to and continuous with the ambient air that was defined by the exhibition container. I chose to work with inert gas because there was not the constant presence of a small object or device that produced the art. Inert gas is a material that's imperceptible. It does not combine with any other element. Here is the place where the gas was released, the Mojave Desert. It goes from measured volume to indefinite expansion, as it says on my poster. That's what gas does. When released, it returns to the atmosphere from which it came. It continues to expand forever in the atmosphere, constantly changing, and it does all this without anybody being able to see it. In the desert, we released all kinds of gases, neon and xenon, the so-called noble gases. The gas is purchased in glass flasks or tanks. The label on the Pyrex flask might read two liter xenon, but you see nothing. You have to trust the manufacturer. When we released a tank in the desert, in the middle of nowhere, it made a whistling sound. That's all we know about its being there. The epitome of the ephemeral, a refusal of form that does not, however, collapse into the sublime, a summation and cancellation of all the clouds ever represented in art, an expenditure of heat, that which life itself mortgages from the sun, a monument to both Heraclitus, you can't put your foot into the same steam twice in this work, and Parmenides, we will not speak of the work's nothingness in the face of the heat, which is the one of every living thing. Let's not forget the ancient sacred springs bubbling up in steamy forgotten mists, sites now cemented over for shopping malls. Undoubtedly, the archaic is celebrated in this work. Dig deep enough, enough between the very spot in which steam is installed and what would be found? Old pottery, broken, once polished stones from forgotten settlements. But dig deeper still and see a broken oil lamp, a Roman, blonde, a Roman bronze strigil. Go deeper beyond every human artifact and into the earth's crust and heat rises. Smoke and the churning, izzards, churning innards of the grumbling gut of the earth itself belches up its indigestion in sulfurous clouds. Let's not forget the stones, thousands of them that since the Cambrian lain in rivers submitted to water's infinitesimal rate of sculpting. Leonardo marveled at the process. How many miniature Brancusi ovoids have been dredged up here to occupy this geometric plane through which steam percolate, percolates? These stones form the base of our monument of steam, but perhaps steam is, after all, an anti-monument. After all, steam is just a lot of hot air, a towering babble of hissing wordless vapor, a physical visual thermal sigh, a sweet warm mute breath wrung reluctantly from Watt's engine of work a damp, incoherent mumble of the delights of evanescence and multiplicity, 
a gaseous upward rush celebrating the contradiction of an object made from thin air. In 1988, I made a performance piece called Heavier Than Air. Several performers whispered sentences from Joe Brainerd's book, I Remember, through CO2 inflated balloons held in front of their mouths while slowly changing the direction of the balloons from left to right and back, focusing the sounds to listeners in various parts of the room. I used whispering because high frequencies of whispers have short wavelengths that travel uh, through the balloons easily. The long wavelength frequencies would have flowed around the balloons, not through them. Sound waves are not particularly directional. They want to spread out from their source. As the waves flow through the balloons, they travel more slowly into the middle than at the edges because the balloon is round. It's thicker in the middle. It takes longer for the waves to pass through, flattening them and causing the waves to exit on a flat plane on the other side, focusing them into a narrow beam. But I wasn't interested in, la in language as a material entity, as something that wasn't involved in, in ideational values. A lot of conceptual art becomes, you know, essentially ideational. How do you mean material, though? Well, just as printed matter, information which has a kind of physical presence for me. This whole conceptual thing that treats language as a secondary thing, a kind of thing that'll disappear when it doesn't disappear. But language is as primary as steel. As far as concepts are concerned, it's completely you know, the idea that art doesn't take a physical form is ridiculous. Even if you just sit there and say, well, I'm not going to talk anymore, that's my statement. Well, already you've hit the air with a few blasts, and that's, your, um, and, that's your, uh, and that's your thing. So there's no escape from the physical, and the only artists I respect are the ones who admit that there's a physical aspect. Let us abandon the object model of liquids and think of fire, specifically of a flame. The topology of a flame is extremely paradoxical. The edges of the flame vary at such a speed for us that it's impossible to say either if they are actually present or where they are. All of a sudden, the flame disappears. It moves somewhere else or it represents itself right here. And it's no longer the same flame. It continues and discontinues. It's more than unstable and less than stable. It's not a flow, as it lacks any constant to give it order. It's a random fluctuation, always the same flame, but bearing no relation to what it was a moment ago. It dances unpredictably. It has no constant edges, frontiers, or margins. The flame, the flame enables us to get away from representationist thinking.
Fire is the work of the multiple, a shaking up of myriads. A cloud is an aggregate, a nebulous set, a multiplicity whose exact definition escapes us and whose local movements are beyond observation. A flame is an aggregate that's even more nebulous. Here then are a couple of concepts in which the multiple reveals itself as such. Heat and flame, cloud and wind, climate and turbulences. We could refer to them as concepts for multiplicities. The most marvelous flame hitherto discovered is now before you. It issues from the single orifice of a steatite burner and reaches a height of 24 inches. The slightest tap on a distant anvil reduces its height to seven inches. When I shake this bunch of keys, the flame is violently agitated and emits a loud roar. The dropping of a sixpence into a hand already containing a coin at a distance of 20 yards knocks the flame down. I cannot walk across the floor without agitating the flame. The creaking of my boots sets it in violent commotion. The crumpling or tearing of a bit of paper or the rustle of a silk dress does the same. It's startled by the pattern of, patter of a raindrop. I hold a watch near the flame. Nobody hears its ticks, but you all see their effect upon the flame. At every tick, it falls. The winding up of the watch also produces tumult. The twitter of a distant sparrow shakes the flame down. The note of a cricket would do the same. From a distance of 30 yards, I've chirped to this flame and caused it to fall and roar. I repeat a passage from Spencer. The flame picks out certain sounds from my utterance. It notices some by the slightest nod. To other, it bows more distinctly. To some, its obeisance is very profound, while to many sounds, it turns an entirely deaf ear. When a brilliant, sensitive flame illuminates an otherwise dark room in which a suitable bell is caused to strike, a series of periodic quenchings of the light by the sound occurs. Every stroke of the bell is accompanied by a momentary darkening of the room. One person, sitting at a small table in the middle of the performance space, lights and adjusts the flame of a propane-fueled Bunsen burner, sensitive flame apparatus, or other specially designed glass or metal tip device to the point just below flaring. Any number of singers, talkers, and players of acoustic or electronic musical instruments positioned at different distances far enough away from the flame so as not to disturb it by air currents from their voices or instruments explore the phenomenon of a responsivity of a gas flame to sound by singing, talking, and playing in such a way as to cause the flame to jump, duck, and bend in predetermined or spontaneous shapes.
now an entirely new phenomenon arouses our attention, in which activity seems to rise against activity, force against force. This, however, is also the only thing that we know with certainty or confidence of the source of that remarkable phenomenon. Perhaps there is no phenomenon in nature which has been observed with such precision in all its relationships, in all the individual variations it takes as the phenomenon of which we speak. However, the theory of electricity has become almost more an enumeration of the machines and instruments which have been invented on its behalf than an exploration of its phenomena. I began investigating electrical fields at the end of the 1970s. I'd been studying electronic music at the conservatory in Milan, but the classes there were very conventional, and I wasn't very satisfied with what I was learning. So I decided to enroll in Milan's technical university. One day, I brought a telephone amplifier, a little cube that you could put next to your telephone so that you could hear it without having the receiver in your hand. The cube was switched on, and when I came into the laboratory, it started to make really strange sounds in my handbag. I took it out and asked my professor what was going on. He explained to me that there were coils in this little cube and they picked up some of the machines in the room. It was like a flash in my mind. It was exactly at the time when I wanted to get away from performance and start producing installations. In my early installations, there were people wandering around with these little cubes in their hands, walking along thick electrical cables that had sounds running through them. It was kind of tiring to have these cubes in your hands all the time. So four or five years later, I found a factory that built wonderful headphones. The sound was better and more subtle, and the headphones worked over longer distances as well. I wanted to go with other pieces and investigations, so I put the equipment away. About eight or 10 years later, when I put on the headphones again, I heard so many strange sounds, humming sounds, rhythms, and all kinds of things that of course disturbed me because I didn't want them. Eventually I realized that I no longer needed to put my sounds in the cables because they were already out there. So I built a new generation of headphones that are especially sensitive to electricity and that don't suppress or ignore all these electromagnetic fields, but instead amplify them. Every current in an electrical conductor, for example, a wire or a cable, generates an electromagnetic field. These currents can be musical, like the signals running through loudspeaker cables, or they can come from electrical activity in the infrastructures of buildings or cities. The magnetic component of these fields is picked up by the sensor coils in the headphones. And after amplification, these signals are made audible by the little speaker systems in the headphones. So if there's an electromagnetic field, say an underground cable, and another one nearby, say the headphones, the fields pick up each other. The sound jumps through the air from one to the other. There are so many sounds and more and more each day. They are so different in every city. Some of the best ones are the security or anti-theft systems that are at the entrance of every shop. When you walk through them, you get pulsating sounds that have different rhythms. Some are so strong that you can't even come near them with the headphones. This summer, I put on my headphones during a very strong thunderstorm. There was no electricity because all the power had gone out, but when I recorded, I got the sounds of natural electricity, which was wonderful. The recording is so strange, very low, but very clear. At two points, you hear voices. You can't understand the words, but you can tell that they're voices. I knew that electricity could transport voices, but I'd never heard it before. It's quite, quite breathtaking to hear things like that. That is, this is nature too, electrical nature. This is very important. Vibrations having substituted for thinghood, could it be said that you made an art form of vibrations, of energy, an art form of energy? Yeah, everything is energy. There's not anything that's not energy. You may say of a minimal sculpture that the object itself is the art, even though it may emit these energies. I wouldn't say it's the energy that's, I would say it's the energy that's my art. Let's go back to your pieces made of extended wire. Yeah, the wires were so thin and in, were in certain places stretched so high above the ground that it was virtually impossible to see them or to photograph them. And from, um, and from that, I went to things that could be neither seen nor perceived in any way. My father, who was an electrical engineer and always worked with carrier waves and radio transmitters ever since I was a kid, helped me out. 
I guess it was the first invisible art. It could not be perceived directly, and in the January 1968 show, I included several carrier wave pieces. One was called 88 megacycles carrier wave FM, and another 1600 kilocycles carrier wave AM. Since you can't photograph a carrier wave, we had to photograph the place where the, wa the carrier wave existed. The carrier waves have several very beautiful qualities. For example, they travel into space with the speed of light. They can be enclosed in a room. The nature of a carrier waves in a room, especially the FM, is affected by people. The body it itself, as you know, is an electrical device. Like a radio or an electric shaver, it affects carrier waves. The carrier waves are part of the electromagnetic spectrum of which light waves are itself a part. A carrier wave is a form of energy. Light waves are made from the same material as carrier waves, only they're different wavelength. The form of a piece is affected, uh, is affected because of the nature of the material that it's made of. The form is changed by the people near it, although the people may not be aware of the fact that they're affecting the actual form of the piece because they can't feel it. And then there was this piece in Seth's show, 40 kilohertz ultrasonic sound wave installation. We call it a sound wave, I don't know why, because we can't hear it. Ultrasonic sound waves have different qualities from ordinary sound waves. They can be directed like a beam and they bounce back from the wall. Actually, you can make invisible patterns and designs with them. They can be diagrammed and measured. I'll do a piece for Jack Burnham for his show in the Jewish Museum. I have to go to the place to work out the walls right then and there. I have some inquiries I wish to advance relating to the usage of the word dematerialization with precise regard to its, incorrect, to its correctness. The Oxford English Dictionary defines dematerialization as to deprive of material qualities. It certainly does not follow that because an object is invisible or less visible than it was or less visible than any other object that any process of dematerialization has taken place. Matter is a specialized form of energy. Radiant energy is the only form in which energy can exist in the absence of matter. Thus, when dematerialization takes place, it means, in terms of physical phenomena, that the conversion of a state of matter into that of radiant energy. This follows as energy can never be created or destroyed. But further, if one were to speak of an art form that used radiant energy, then one would be committed to the contradiction of speaking of a formless form, and one can imagine the verbal acrobatics that might take place when the romantic metaphor was put to work on questions concerning formless forms, non-material, and material forms. I will be in New York over Easter. I would welcome an exchange of views with you. Thanks.